If you're planning to travel north from Edinburgh, you should consider making a short stop in Dunfermline at the birthplace of Andrew Carnegie. For many people, particularly visitors from the US, the name Carnegie is immediately synonymous with the Carnegie Hall in New York, or one of the many libraries funded by Carnegie himself, such as the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. However, what many people don't know is that he came from a very humble background. Born on the 25th of November 1835, he lived in one half of this cottage until the age of 12, when his parents decided to emigrate to America, seeking a better life for the family. Note that there are two doors to this property, that is because the Carnegie family lived in the left hand of the property, on the upper floor, and another family lived on the right hand side. Downstairs his father had two hand looms. Here is a living accommodation for the Carnegie family of five. All the cooking, eating, washing, sleeping took place in this space which is no more than 15 square feet. Is it any wonder that they sought a better life? This would have been considered to be a good standard of accommodation. Apart from the living conditions, the main reason that the family chose to emigrate is because their small hand weaving business was threatened by the ever increasing industrialisation in Scotland. This together with successive years of poor harvests meant that the Scottish people were literally starving. In the small room off from the living area is where his mother would spin the yarn and pass it down through the trapdoor to his father who would then weave the silk cloth. The patterns would be created by these punch cards that you can see in this image. If you happen to be lucky enough to visit on the one day of the month that this gentleman is here, you can see him working the handloom. It's fascinating but must have been such hard work for Carnegie's father working from sunrise to sunset as well as training a journeyman to learn the trade. Watch as he explains about the operation of the handloom. Four years at university and when they come back to us hopefully they've managed to graduate in some form of constructive textile or design or whatever. Now the very first thing we do when they come into us and are looking for work we will set them down at a one pedal loom and watch how they work. And normally within two hours we can tell if that young person has got sufficient coordination to be able to train to produce fabric at a commercially acceptable level. Mm -hmm. The minimum length of cloth I must weave per day on a little loom like this would be six and a half to seven yards of cloth a day. Now when I'm working at the end of a full working day this shuttle will have passed backwards and forwards somewhere between eight and a half to nine and a half thousand times. Mm -hmm. uh, every time the shuttle must be thrown, my legs must actually operate across the pedals. My brain must also remember the card sequence that we're on, because when we're sitting working, not only are we weaving the pattern, or the cards are lifting the, the warp threads for me to weave the pattern, there look, that's all the cards are doing for me, they're lifting blocks of thread in a sequence from which the weaver will make the pattern. And that's, that's derived by how many times you will physically throw the shuttle. Now if I was just to sit here and throw the shuttle to that one card, all we would weave would be great big long brown stripes. So we have to know when to make, make the card change. And the reason for that being that when the, the system was devised for using in the silk weaving industry in France in the, in the, in the early 1800s, they put everything into a one pedal loom. So they basically took all the skill away from the weaver and he just became an operator. Well, the Scottish linen weaver said, no, I've trained for seven years to learn to weave 90 odd patterns on, the, on my eight pedals underneath my loom. I still want to wish to keep those, but I'll put a figure from the cards. <laughs> Shuttle. Uh, 
I thought you were counting for me. Although this video has only looked at the interior of the cottage that Carnegie lived in, there is a superb museum next door that follows his life in America, from when he started out as a telegraph messenger boy until he eventually sold his steel business and overnight became the wealthiest man in the world. During the remainder of his life he gave away most of his wealth to good causes. This location is well worth visiting to learn about a real rags to riches story.